talking about ambassadors. Um, talking about ambassadors today. It's interesting, uh, again, as I looked at some of those examples of ambassadors, um, these are people that are largely anonymous to us. Uh, we don't know. I mean, I, I remember when, I li- when we lived in Japan, I knew who the American ambassador was at that time. It mattered to us uh, that there was a representative of the United States, of the president and of our government there in, uh, there in that country, foreign country where we lived. But they're kind of anonymous. Uh, ambassadorships are given out as political rewards and so forth. And yet they, and so they, in some ways, they seem almost insignificant. In some of the confirmation hearings, I remember on one, the guy who was, uh, um, who was being interviewed for the ambassador of Norway, essentially the Senate confirmation group said, this person knows absolutely nothing about the country of Norway. I mean, it was that kind of summary statement. Another person said, he was nominated for Argentina, like ambassador to Argentina, and they asked him, have you ever been there? Well, no, I haven't ever been there. Might be good to go there once, right, before you're actually the United States representative in that place. Um, and at the same time, ambassadors have played a significant role at times. Um, <clears throat> you know, we know of stories from World War II leading up to World War II the ambassador to Germany really got it wrong about Hitler. Did not have any clue, had no idea that Hitler would become as powerful and controlling of the entire nation. He thought that he was going to be assassinated and ousted and therefore raised very few red flags as a representative back to, uh, to the United States. Um, the first Gulf War when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, this one is actually recorded for us formally in history. The, the ambas- our ambassador there to Iraq uh, did not communicate to Saddam Hussein, George W. H. W. Bush's resolve that if Kuwait was invaded, he would respond in kind. Did never communicated it. Might have avoided it altogether. Might have avoided the next 16 years of war. Um, so these things have impact. There are there is influence that people have in that situation. And sometimes ambassadors are actually in more risk and more danger than we imagine. We think it's a cushy job where you just take people out to dinner and you host events and things like that. You represent the country and you, you give out swag, I guess, or something like that. But, what it is, but what's interesting is, especially in a variety of countries, maybe not as stable, you're often on the front line. You're there, yeah, so you have a consulate that's supposed to be sacred. Yeah, whatever. You're there and you're in a foreign country, and you represent the United States, and so you are at risk. There is risk that's involved in it as well. And I found this an interesting parallel for me when I think about when Paul says, we are ambassadors for Christ, and I go, boy, I feel like some of those losers that they interviewed. Uh, If you're really going to make me an ambassador for Christ, and maybe there's a good analogy there. Um, Maybe it isn't about what we know. Maybe it isn't about how good we are. Maybe it is all about the one we represent. And maybe that's what it's supposed to be. Let's look at this together for a little bit. Um, In 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Chapter 5. Because here's how Paul begins the section. And I want to talk about this. And Mr. Hayes would just love it if he was here today. Because he says, from now on, So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Now that's interesting because that's a red flag for Mr. Hayes, isn't he? Those of you that have been his students, worldview. Because Mr. Hayes loves to talk about the differing worldviews that there are and how they have evolved over time. Our worldview in this church, what we represent, is a biblical worldview, a Christian biblical worldview in which we have been made by God as the pinnacle of creation. We are the focus of His love. We have a broken humanity in which cannot resolve or save itself. And yet God did not abandon us and became a human being in Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man, the full and complete atonement and salvation and redeemer of our sins. And through Him and through Him alone, we are saved. And therefore, God's Word, as it's revealed to us, is not burdensome or onerous, but rather a joy that God guides us and loves us and continues to intervene in His world and share His wisdom, His love, and His promises with us. That's about as simply as I can summarize our Christian biblical worldview. In a simpler sense, in this world, we would call it theism. In the the simplest sense, 
that there, are, there is a worldview, a traditional worldview, in which God is active and intervened into this world. And so that's a, the, a theistic worldview. But there are a number of other current uh, worldviews which are dominant. One of them is called new spirituality. Another one is postmodernism, and there's even a stage past that, but postmodernism. Uh, which, and so, so new spirituality kind of finds itself wrapped up in the idea that, well, everybody really believes the same thing. That's really what that is. And then the next one is, uh, is the idea of secularism. And secularism really is you have to prove it to me. If science can't prove it to me, then it can't be true. Um, another one is postmodernism. Your truth is your truth, you know, which is actually a moxymoron, a contradiction in terms. But anyway, you know, whatever you think is true is true. Um, and then there's like a Marxism, you know, in which a kind of a collective, uh, the maldistribution of wealth, and we need to distribute wealth differently, and the government should be the agency for that. So there's different worldviews. And so what's interesting is George Barna, the most respected uh, Christian kind of uh, pollster, <clears throat> did this poll just about two years ago, came out with the results, essentially asking, we know there are all these worldviews out there, and it makes sense that there are different worldviews with different people in different countries and different ethnic groups and so forth all around the world. But the question George Barna wanted to ask was, how is that reflected among Christians? How are these other worldviews reflected among Christians? So do Christians hold to a biblical Christian worldview? What percentage of Christians hold to many of these other principles? And the results were a little bit um, uh, troubling in some ways. Now, I'm going to make some statements. You should just know that when I say these things, I'm telling you that they are not, not congruent with the Christian biblical worldview, okay? And we can, I can explain that to you in a longer time if you want to. But because I may say some of these things and you may in your mind say, sounds right to me, right? So here we go. First one in this area of new spirituality. Among, here was the question that was asked. All people pray to the same God or spirit no matter what name they use for that spiritual being. That was the question, okay? Do you, would you agree or disagree or strongly agree? And this is the percentage of people among practicing Christians. So that would be us, right? People who come to church, study the Word, pray, that kind of thing. Among practicing Christians, 28% said yes to that, strongly agree. I'm telling you that's wrong. You can debate with me later about that. But I am telling you that the Scriptures clearly teach, I am God and there is no other. There is one name under heaven and earth by which you may be saved, and that name is Jesus Christ. I'm just telling you. That's what Scripture says. It's not very politically correct. I'm just telling you. That's what a worldview, a biblical worldview says. But 28% of practicing Christians strongly agree that whoever you're praying to, it's all the same. Here's the next one. In secularism, here's an interesting one. Meaning, here's the question, meaning and purpose come from working hard to earn as much as possible so you can make the most of life. 20% of of practicing Christians strongly agreed with that statement, one in five. If you're under 45, 37% agree with that statement, strongly agree with it, okay? Postmodernism, here you go. Here was the statement. What is morally right or wrong depends on what an individual believes, right? What's morally right or wrong depends on what you believe. 23% of practicing Christians strongly agree. If you're under 45, 37% strongly agree. Here's another one. This one's not quite as bad, but it's fascinating. If your beliefs offend someone or hurt their feelings, it's wrong. Now, it's wrong to hurt another person. But that, what, but that the thing you believe in, right, if, if it causes offense in someone else, that that's wrong, okay? 15% of practicing Christians strongly agreed with that. If you're under 45, 29%. How about this one? This one is on, George Barner calls it Marxism, right? So here's the comment, the statement. The government, rather than individuals, should control as much of the resources as necessary to ensure that everyone gets their fair share. Now, by the way, on this one, I don't know that Scripture has anything to say about this, personally. I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you it's a worldview. So it's intriguing. 14% of practicing Christians strongly agree with that. 30% if you're under 45 So this is what's interesting. If Paul says, so no longer are we going to deal with anyone from a worldly point of view, we better ask what's the other worldview, 
right? And so Paul explains it, and that's what I want to share with you in these four points. Now, this is not exhaustive, but I think this is helpful because I wanted to encourage you in the end. Because when I stop to think about it, often when I stop and say, am I a good ambassador for Christ, I, there are times I fail miserably. If I am a consistent, regular representative of my Savior. And so I am thankful that like many of these applicants for con for the, to be ambassadors, they weren't highly qualified, and they still got to be an ambassador. I'm glad that God still uses me and uses us. Okay, here's the first thing. The first one is this. Paul starts off then by saying, if anyone is in Christ, so here's the new worldview. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Now, you know what the old worldview will say? That's baloney. You ain't new. There's nothing new about you. You're just the same old person. And you know what? If I was honest, boy, they could say a lot, a lot of times that's true. How does your language use? How do you spend your money? How do you spend your time? What do you do? Is there anything new about me? Well, here's what's new about me. Let me tell you this. And when I, and when I relent in this area, because look at what Paul says. The old is gone. The new has come. You know how Paul talks about this in Romans? The old is gone. The old Adam is dead and the new Adam has taken his place. And when Paul talks about the new Adam, the new Adam is Jesus Christ. What God is not trying to do, I don't believe, I, in these passages, I don't think God is trying to say, I'm going to make you a new person, I'm going to kick the old guy out, and I'm going to take residence. Because that's what we pray in the Lord's Prayer. Do you agree with me on this? Our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. I want your kingdom to come and I want your will to be done in, in earth as in heaven, right? As well as it's being done in heaven, I want to be done in earth. What are we praying there? Lord, take up residence here. Rule this heart. Rule my heart. Because if you rule here, something different's going to happen. I don't, I really, I don't know. Too often I'm afraid my prayers have been in the past. And this would be worth a conversation. I'm not being dogmatic here. I'm thinking out loud. Because what I'm saying is, all the times I've tried to go to God and say, make me a better man, have not worked. And in fact, what I need God to do is say, I need you to take up residence here instead of me. I need you to take up residence here. And I believe that's what the prayer is when Jesus guides us to pray. I want God to take up residence. That's the new creation. And so when anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old Adam is dead. The new Adam has taken up residence. Second thing, so are you reconciled to God? Then you're debt free. He, Paul says all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. If you mark in your Bibles, if you're, if you're using your Bible and want to do that, mark that verse, not counting men's sins against them. So I'm, I'm into this new TV show. I don't know if any, of you, if any of you have heard of this show or seen it. I want you to raise your hand. It's on, uh, I, I got it. I was cruising along through Prime Video. It's called, it's the most popular show in Canada. It's called Corner Gas. Anybody? Okay, this is intriguing. I should probably not use this illustration. Okay. <laughs> I think it'll still make sense. I love it. It's set in Saskatchewan in the town of Dog River. And it has like nothing. There's like nothing there. So there's a corner gas station and a little cafe. And, that's, and there's a grain elevator in the co-op. I mean, that's about it. So there's these few people and these characters that interact together. And I'm cracking up. I'm, la I'm loving this show. Because a lot of it's about hockey and curling and mosquitoes, things like that. <laughs> so it's all of this. So anyway, but there's this one scene where these two buddies, the one guy knows that he's going to have to put up about 500 yards of fencing. And the other guy knows it, and he knows he's going to ask him for a favor. So he's dodging him for days, through the whole show, day after day, he's dodging him so that he, de he can't do anything, right? The other guy can't do anything for him, which would make him obligated. Do you get where I'm saying? So he's dodging his friend, because his friend wants to hold the door and carry a bag, or he wants to wash his windshield, and he's running away so that he can't be obligated to the guy. I'm just, I'm cracking up this whole time. Because too often, I'm afraid we're that way too. Sometimes it's tough to receive a gift from the Lord because we wonder, what we, now what's he going to ask of us? 
And so it's intriguing because in this particular case, I love this phrase, if you've been reconciled to God, then you are debt-free. It's intriguing because so many faith systems, uh, uh, so many faith systems make us out to continue to be obligated to God, that in some way we owe Him. We owe Him a debt, and you better get busy paying off that debt. And that's not how God works. God was reconciling the Word to Himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And I love this, this one because the idea is uh, he, we're not keeping score. So like an old joke that I tell at, in weddings, I love to tell this one in weddings, um, and the story goes like this. In marriage, God intends, right, God intends for the two to become one. The problem starts when they try to decide which one, <laughs> right, which one. And the way that works is by keeping score, is by keeping score. And I played lots and lots of sports, and uh, man, I loved it. My Mariners won their first two games in Japan. It's awesome. They were beating the Red Sox and then lost the ninth inning. But anyway, and they won again. I couldn't believe it. They're keeping score. I played lots of, and I'm one of those guys who I struggle to play for fun. I, I struggle to play for fun. If I'm playing, let's keep score. Okay? I just, I want you to keep score. Um, and you know what? I'm really screwed up for that. I'm really screwed up uh, in many, many ways. And I'm not just saying this facetiously because I would keep score in, every, in lots of things, right? School, I want to keep score. I wanted to get the high score in the class. I wanted to have my division tables done first. I wanted to get the best score on the project. Um, if a teacher said I'm not going to grade that, I would ask him to grade it anyway. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm sick. I mean, I'm kind of sick. Because, because here's the problem, here's the problem, right? In the end, you, you talk about, and I forget what it is across all sports, but the kids who start playing club sports, right, and they play club sports, and their parents are spending thousands, thousands of dollars every year, and they're driving them all over, and they're doing this, and they're going there, and doing this, and missing that, and missing that. You know what percentage of those kids get to be, right, to get the full ride scholarship, and what percentage of those kids get? It's like one in a thousand, like one in a thousand. Well, God bless them if they get it. God bless them. But all along that path, you had to learn that keeping score mattered, right? And how often does a score end that the person who actually didn't deserve it still got the better score? How often does that happen? The luck of the draw or a lucky bounce or something didn't happen or somebody got sick, somebody got injured, and, then, and, we don't keep, and so we keep score. And the thing that's, that's so interesting to me is I'm, I'm longing to learn to play for fun. I'm longing to learn that just the game itself is worth playing. I'm struggling in that area. I mean, I stop watching my teams because they lose all the time. <laughs> right? I stop watching. And when they win, it, then I start watching them again. <laughs> Something is broken in that Something is broken there. And so I am so thankful. And what I want to do is keep reminding each other, because if we kept score around here all the time, and sometimes we do anyway, we don't, maybe we don't mean to, but sometimes we do. Well, that person didn't call me, or that person didn't notice, or that person didn't reach out, or they didn't help me when I asked for, or they forgot to pray for me, or they did this or that. We're keeping score. And we have a God who doesn't keep score. That's a different worldview, my friends. That is a different worldview. The third thing that he talks about in terms of being an ambassador is this. Reconcilers are God's ambassadors. He has committed then to us the message of reconciliation. We're therefore Christ's ambassadors. And these are powerful words. Again, if you mark in your Bibles, as though God were making his appeal through us. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, that 10th Avenue North song. It's a really cool one. I'm just going to mention it again because I think it illustrates it again. 10th Avenue North has a song that says, God, you don't need me but somehow you want me. It's a good song. There's, that's a, there's a great sentiment in there. Because existentially, God doesn't need anyone. But here's the cool thing. God has chosen to need you. This is a significant statement. I said it several weeks ago. I'm probably going to repeat it periodically. God has chosen to need you. If not you, who? If not now, when? Those statements. God has chosen to need you each of us, because he has entrusted to us the ministry of reconciliation. 
I mean, the irony of this, the irony of this is that, you know, this uh, Lutheran pastor who wrote the Red Letter Challenge, Zach Zender, he's talking about this and he's saying, you know, what are the things that Jesus is known for? Jesus is known for patience and compassion, tenderness, he loves children, he's faithful, he's kind, he's gracious, he's loving, without conditions. Jesus is all those things. What are Jesus' followers known for? Not those things. I mean, I wish, we wish it was always, but we're mostly known in the culture by worldview, judgmental, hypocritical, impatient, exclusive, right? That kind of intolerant. Now, those are the statements that are often used for Christians. And so somehow, here's the point. An ambassador, here's what I, I learned from this. It appears to me that ambassadors don't have to be hugely competent. They don't have to be highly qualified within themselves. They don't have to be, they don't have to be any, but they have to share the same worldview as the one who appoints them. And this is God's worldview. God's worldview is that he says, you no longer live, but I live in you. God's worldview is, you do not owe me. I have given freely to you because I am not keeping score. I have never kept score. I will never keep score. You are mine. The third one is, he says, and now because you have been reconciled, I now appoint you to be my ambassador because that is the singular requirement, is that you have been reconciled by God. You who were broken have been made whole. You who were wounded have been healed. You who were lost have been found. You who were on the shelf of the palm shop have been redeemed by the one who walked in and bought you back. He has taken your place. He has become sin for you. And so we have been reconciled with God. And therefore, anyone reconciled by God represents him with the full authority of the one who has redeemed us. People, there is no greater calling than we could have. And you're qualified for it because you've been redeemed, because you've been restored, because you've been healed. I'll tell you what prevents us from being God's ambassadors, Christ's ambassadors. This is what prevents me or prevents us is I, I, I'm afraid that sometimes we are not fully convinced that we've been reconciled to God or that if we were reconciled to God, it was because of some really cool quality within us that God did that. And when we acknowledge, when, and this season of Lent is so appropriate, when we come before the Lord with a broken and contrite spirit, when we come with an empty heart and say, Lord, make me yours, restore me, redeem me, Christ always does so. And so what the old worldview says is you're a nobody, you're not qualified, you aren't able. Instead, Christ says, because I've made you mine, you can stand with the full authority of Christ. Now, how does this happen? The how, the last one, is this idea of do versus done. How do you share this with somebody? How do you do that? And I love this analogy of do versus done because the thing is, do versus done means that most of the world thinks you have to do stuff to make God like you. And instead, the Christian worldview says, nope, already been done for you. And that that's a tough thing for a lot of people to hear. I'm going to read you this little chunk out of The Great Divorce. The Great Divorce is one of C.S. Lewis. My, my, it's one of my very favorites of his. I say that about all of his. But anyway, it's one of my favorites of his. And it's about a group who go from hell to heaven, and they're met by people in heaven who have been saved, and they are entreated. We implore you. Be reconciled to Christ, right? We entreat you. Please come and stay. Accept and stay. And so this one man was a bartender. He's a man in a bowler hat. Big guy. He was a bartender and he owned a shop. And he's in hell. And he's on the bus, comes up. But he sees, guess who he meets? He meets the guy in his bar who worked for him and murdered somebody. And this doesn't make sense to him. Here's how it goes. Sorry. He says, uh, but you murdered him. Oh, of course I did. But it's all right now. All right, is it? All right for you, you mean. But what about the poor chap himself laying cold and dead? But he isn't. I've told you, you're going to meet him soon. He sends his love. Well, what I'd like to understand, said the ghost, is what you're here for is please his punch, you a bloody murderer. Well, I've been walking the streets down there and living in a place like a pigsty all these years. Well, that's a little hard to understand at first, but it's all over now. You'll be pleased about it presently. Till then, there's no need to bother about it. 
no need to bother about it. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? Uh, no, not as you mean. I don't look at myself. I've given up myself. I had to, you know, after the murder. That was what it did for me, and that's how everything began. Well, personally, said the big ghost, personally, I'd have thought that you and I ought to be the other way around. That's my personal opinion. Very likely we soon shall be, if you'll stop thinking about it. Well, look at me now, said the ghost, slapping its chest. I've gone straight all my life. I don't say I was a religious man. I don't say I had no faults, far from it. But I've done my best all my life, see? I've done my best by everyone. That's the sort of chap I was. I never asked for anything that I wasn't mine by rights. If I wanted a drink, I paid for it. If I took my wages, I've done my job. That's the sort I was, and I don't care who knows it. Uh, it would be much better not to go on about that now. Who's going on? I'm not going on. I'm not arguing. I'm just telling you the sort of chap I was, see? I'm asking for nothing but my rights. You may think you can put me down because you're dressed up like that, and I'm only a poor man, but I got to have my rights same as you, see? Oh, no, it's not so bad as that. I haven't got my rights, or I should not be here. You will not get yours either. You'll get something far better. Never fear. Well, that's just what I say. I haven't got my rights. I always done my best and I never done nothing wrong. And what I don't see is why I should be put below a bloody murderer like you. Who knows whether you will be? Only be happy and come with me. What do you keep on arguing for? I'm only telling you the sort of chap I am. I only want my rights. I'm not asking for anybody's bleeding charity. Then do. At once. Ask for the bleeding charity. Everything is here for the asking and nothing can be bought. And that, my friends, is the new worldview. And that's the ambassador of Christ, the bloody murderer who asked for the bleeding charity. Because the last point is the old worldview is you're just a freeloader. And the answer is thanks be to God. May that be my words to the people so that they can see Christ. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you that you call us to be ambassadors. I don't know that I always thank you for that. I know that it's always the first thing on my lips because sometimes, Lord, I'd like to be anonymous. I'd like to be unknown. I'd like to hide in a corner. Sometimes I just want to do what I want to do. But Lord, you're relentless in your grace and your love and your restoration. Thank you for your healing power. And so you have healed the wounded. You have restored the broken. You have purchased us back when we were lost and we were worthless, and you gave us great value. And so, Lord, may we be those ambassadors, the ambassadors who simply declare what you have done for us all. To the praise and honor of your name, amen.